So uh, my name is John O'Keefe, and um, I'm from Instantiations. From, for those of you who might not know me, uh, I spent 40 years at IBM um, and was the chief architect for the last mm, 10 years to 50, at least for Visual Age small talk there. Left IBM, went to Instantiations when they acquired Visual Age small talk from IBM and have been the, uh, I've been the uh, principal small talk architect for that company since then. So I have a long history in small talk. Um, I've used every one of them, every one of them. Uh, and I'm here to tell you about um, just what's going on with, uh, with the company and with the product. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about the company. Um, you may or may not know that Instantiations used to be a small talk and Java company. We had a number of Java tools uh, as well as our small talk tools. Uh, we sold all of the Java uh, tooling to uh, Google last year, August of last year. Um, and now we are a pure small talk company. Um, in the last year, our number of users and our revenue continues to grow, which means that uh, we can grow our engineering staff. So we've added four engineers to our staff over the last year, and we are also using contractors for additional capacity. So our, uh, we've ramped up our development ability considerably over the last year. Um, we've also uh, been involved in university outreach uh, I've been, I was working last year with uh, Hasso Plotner Institute in uh, Potsdam, Germany on a bachelor project to do uh, GTK bindings for Linux. Um, the project was both successful and unsuccessful. Successful in that um, um, we got a lot of good technology from the students. Unsuccessful in uh, this was our first uh, project working this way and uh, we kind of failed to scope it properly, so it didn't get done. Uh, but we have, we have the work that did get done, and we will be um, finishing it um, based on our, our product schedules and uh, hopefully releasing that, uh, those bindings. Uh, this, will, uh, this will solve a, a long-standing issue that many people have had with our, with our Linux uh, support, that it's based on Motif and it looks really bad. <laughs> um, we're interested in doing that more. We didn't, we didn't do a project this year because of, because of timing considerations, but we'll probably go back there next year to do another project. And if there are other universities that have the same sort of, um, of program where the students do a, a major project as part of the curriculum, uh, we're certainly interested in talking to them and seeing if we can uh, come to some arrangement um, to include them in this outreach. Um, we also participated at conferences. This is uh, the second year I've been at Small Talks. Uh, I intend to keep coming for a number of years, as long as I'm working. Um, we also, you know, we've had a, uh, an online forum for many years, uh, but it it was uh, based on uh, some bulletin board software, and it didn't really aggregate well with anything else in the world. So we've converted to using Google Groups, and it's aggregated on Smalltalk World now, uh, along with uh, uh, many other Smalltalk um, sort of uh, uh, mailing lists and groups. And finally, um, we have a number of new uh, podcasts and videos accessible from our website. Um, James Robertson has, um, has been doing a, an extensive series of videos on VA Smalltalk. So if you're at all interested in VA Smalltalk, I encourage you to, uh, to look at those videos. They're really good. Um, our recent release history, well, you know, we went through a series of uh, V8OX sort of releases. Uh, and uh, now, uh, just before ISOG, um, we released version 8.5, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. 
So for version 8.5, our newest, our newest uh, release, um, we've, we've done work in a number of areas uh, in terms of development tools. We've added Code Assist to our, uh, to our development browsers. And I'll show you a little bit about, if I have time at the end, I'll do a demo. Uh, for infrastructure, we've added a, a logging framework, a common logging framework that we're going to be converting all our logging um, activities to use and it's it's really available for customer use also uh, for logging and tracing we've added a preference setting framework um, we've had sort of preference settings scattered everywhere in the past and we've we've consolidated them into a framework um, as you see we're going to be putting a GUI on that in the future release and um, we've added deprecation exceptions so that uh, we can actually identify code that um, has become outmoded. And if you use Seaside, you know about uh, deprecation exceptions. This is, this is uh, a similar idea, but built into the base system. Uh, in terms of graphics and, and, uh, and windowing systems, we've added support for the rebar control on Windows. I'll show you that. Um, and for fax support, we've added a new encoding scheme. Uh, which uh, um, many of our customers have uh, asked for because it's the scheme that they're getting their faxes in and we weren't able to read them. Um, for the web interface, we upgraded our Seaside support to the most current version at the time and um, we added support for HTTP chunk transfer encoding, uh, which uh, is useful in dynamic environments where you don't know at the beginning of, uh, of a message transmission how big the message will be. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of these now. So starting with Code Assist. Um, the problem is developers, you know, we have huge brains, but we can't, we can't keep everything in there. And so we forget the names of things. We forget how methods are spelled where the bicapitalization is, many things like that. It's just too much to clutter our minds with. So the solution is to use the computer's calculating capability to help us with that, to provide, to predict and provide suggestions for um, what you're trying to do. So the way we've implemented it, and this is maybe a little different than, uh, than other implementations, is we started out with a general extensible content assist framework. And we actually have a, uh, our sample code for this is a text editor that uses content assist. Um, so nothing to do with code, nothing to do with being able to um, look at uh, any, uh, any parse trees of the system to predict, but simply looking at, at the text that's typed in and suggesting. Um, what might be coming next. Um, we also, that framework also provides layout functionality for laying out pop-ups because when you're doing content assist, you're obviously going to pop something up on the screen to uh, provide the suggestions. Um, and finally, it has APIs and extension points that allow you to customize it uh, for your own use. So once we had that, we needed uh, configuration support so we have a, a number of configuration options um, having to do with the content assist. Um, visibility, whether you show public, private, or all methods. Uh, the number of suggestions that you show without scrolling. Um, and many other things. So we have context sensitive auto completion in all the code browsers in the workspaces and in the debugger. Um, we provide suggestions for methods, for symbols, um, and variables. It uses parse tree analysis. Um, this is something we couldn't have done years ago because the machines weren't fast enough. But there is a, a considerable amount of computation that goes on behind the scenes. And some of, it's, some of the information is cached, some of it isn't. 
uh, but a considerable amount of computation that goes on in order to be able to provide relevant suggestions. So um, the suggestions are actually uh, sorted based on uh, uh, the fact that uh, we, su we suggest local variables before global variables. Um, we suggest public methods before private methods, if, you do, if you're showing both. Um, and we uh, sort classes that extend application or sub-application at the end of the list because they seem to be classes that you're less likely to be um, referencing. This, of course, is all customizable. So our suggestion descriptions provide additional details about uh, what's going on. For methods, we don't just provide the name of the method, but we'll provide the class name that provides that method uh, as um, sort of a clue, perhaps, to whether that method is the one you're looking for. Um, for pool variables, um, we'll provide the value of the pool variable. For um, uh, ambiguous receivers, this is, this is an interesting problem because uh, sometimes you don't know or you can't tell exactly what the user has in mind in terms of doing code completion. So for this example, uh, order collection new, add an array of elements, and then type DE and activate code assist. Um, you can activate code assist either uh, automatically, generally after three characters have been typed, or explicitly. Um, so what's the, what's the user want to do? Um, does he want to complete before, for add before? Or does he want to complete um, between? Could, could be, um, could be uh, he wants to use between and provide another parameter and add that to uh, the ordered collection. So we'll provide, we, we provide both suggestions, let you pick, because we don't know. Um, for method completion, we auto insert um, parentheses. This is um, the only kind of smart character processing in version 8.5. Um, we're planning on extending that capability in the future. Um, smart characters are something that some people love and some people hate. So it will be, um, it'll be an enablement option. Um, and we can also suggest method overrides. So if you're at the top of, uh, of a code pane, um, and you select uh, code assist, we'll provide you a list of methods that you may want to override in this class. So that's, uh, yes. turn on. Yeah, I'd like to ask you something about the code completion. Does it work with the debugger also? Yes. And do you use some kind of context on the debugger to realize messages for example, when you are the debugger, you have all the context. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a you know, uh, bio, you, you can get the type of the bio, so you can suggest the messages. Do you do something like that, or just a um, general algorithm in like the other places? Um, so, my answer is, I don't know. Okay. Um, which is the answer that I hate to give, but I have to give sometimes. No, because but uh, that's that I yes, thought, mm -hmm. that's there's there's more information available there right. than in a normal code browser, and right. I don't know if our developer made use of that information or not. Okay. Okay. Um, the uh, the next new feature in uh, 8.5 is uh, our logging framework. The, uh, the problem that we were looking to solve is that the product currently contains um, more than I can count on one hand logging frameworks. Um, and none of them are really documented and none of them are really intended for customer usage. There are just various places where we need to do logging and so somebody wrote a little logging framework. Um, our solution is to try and draw all that into a common um, framework that everyone can use 
and people can lay requirements on for extension uh, as opposed to all these little ones. So how does that work? Um, so it starts out that um, we kind of surveyed the world uh, of logging and it appears that log4j uh, is uh, you know, the very popular uh, logging uh, mechanism in Java. Uh, there were already some logging frameworks that were available as um, open source projects uh, in the VA, VA Goodies uh, repository, um, particularly um, Toothpick, uh, which has been around for a while, written by Joseph Pellerine, that captured a lot of the same concepts as Log4j, but wasn't nearly as complete as the Log4j framework. So um, we decided to base our work on log4j. It's not a port of log4j because this is small talk, this isn't Java, and there's different techniques that you need to do uh, for implementing frameworks. But essentially, um, you have a log manager which is, log which is managing appenders, which are things that know how to write to files, to sockets, to uh, in-memory uh, uh, arrays. Uh, there's any number of appenders provided with the system. Um, those appenders depend on layout objects to know what to log. And the users then use the logger object in order to access the appender, which will then decide, based on the, the severity and priority levels that have been assigned, uh, to the appender whether that particular logging event should actually occur or whether it should be ignored. Um, that's uh, a 15 second capsule of the architecture. So I'm going to just give a small example. Let's say that uh, a bank uh, has to keep monthly logs of uh, foreign transactions and weekly logs of transactions that involve more than $10,000. Um, because in the United States at least um, they have to report to the government any transaction of over ten thousand dollars although I understand it's down to five now <laughs> so um, the uh, the way this works is in your INI file which is the startup customization file you declare that you want to create a logger you define an append a, a rolling file appender rolling file appender means that uh, entries are added to the end of the file and um, you write the foreign transactions there. You create another rolling file appender that's conditioned on being the first day of the week uh, and there you write the, uh, the big uh, transactions. Okay, so that's, that's the way the, the logger and appender are created. Then in your, in your application um, you can define special logging methods if you want special information to be written to the log. Otherwise, uh, it just uses print string. Um, and so your application code might look like this. Um, ask if it's a foreign transaction. You tell the log manager that you want to write the transaction um, to the foreign transaction appender. If it's a, an amount greater than 10,000, you want to write it to the large foreign transaction appender. And that's really all there is to doing logging. Simple case. Um, it can get very complicated, and we have significant documentation on how to do this. Um, so this is, this is what the output might look like in, in that rolling file. The next new feature is our preference setting framework. As I said, we have, uh, we have some, some sort of standardized preference settings in the system. We also have a number of subsystems that manage their own preferences, all using different mechanisms. Uh, and we wanted to provide a single uh, preference setting framework that would at least capture the needs of most uh, of these uh, different implementations. We recognize that there are some special cases um, because um, there, are, there are sometimes 
timing considerations of when the preference is actually um, activated uh, that uh, don't fit into the pattern of this framework. Uh, there are also some um, preference setting values that don't match our parsing algorithms currently. So there will be some, some preferences that can't be managed. But the notion is that preferences are held in an INI file, once again, startup customization. Um, they're in Windows INI file format. That is, you have a stanza name followed by keyword equals value. Stanza names are typically the name of the application. Um, keyword equals value. The values are typed so that we can convert them from strings to their internal types. So we have a number of simple types, and then complex types are uh, array and range of value. You have to implement three methods. You have to tell us what the valid settings are. You have to tell us what the current and default settings are. So if you don't provide a value in the, in the INI file, what value should we use? And you have to provide code that will actually set the value into the location uh, where you want it, generally a class variable. Uh, the preferences are all read at image startup, or when an application is loaded, they're removed when an application is removed. So these are sort of examples of what one of these uh, valid settings methods would look like. Um, you're essentially are saying that you want to um, have a setting named FP level and it can range from 0 to 9 and it's, a, and it's, a, it's an integer. Okay? So we will, we will use that information in parsing the input that comes from uh, the any file. Um, the set current settings is where we transfer the information that you provide in the any file into your application. Uh, so, for example, um, if you want to set the location of our manager, um, you can read it from the INI file and set it into a class variable. So, um, we're going to be converting all our various and sundry um, settings uh, handling to use this framework. And I encourage uh, uh, those of you who use VA Smalltalk to do the same. Um, finally, deprecation exceptions. If you've used Seaside, you know about deprecation exceptions. We've put it into the base. Um, you can log into an in-memory um, collection. You can write to the transcript. Um, or you can actually raise an exception if you want to know immediately that a deprecated method was called. Or you can do nothing. You can ignore it. And we provide, uh, we provide some sample code on how to dump out the in-memory uh, collection if you want to do that. Um, so I'm going to skip past the rest of that. Uh, rebar controls. Um, we provide a number of different Windows controls, window common controls, but we don't provide them all. We've added rebar control, which looks like this. It's the thing in the... Uh, in the toolbar that has the little dotted line, the little handle, that, so that you can drag it left and right. The gripper. Um, and uh, so this is, this is uh, in 8.5, this is in our uh, basic um, support. That is, um, you can programmatically add these to your UI. Um, it's in the Window Builder Pro product, but it's not in the Composition Editor. It'll be in the Composition Editor in the next release. Um, I talked about fax support earlier. Um, customers wanted to read faxes that they couldn't, so we've implemented uh, support for a different encoding mechanism. Um, Seaside it was ported up to uh, 305 with fixes through um, August for the next release. Um, we will probably be releasing an early 
3063 uh, before the actual next release comes out um, because there's some fixes uh, to Seaside that our customers have reported and we want to be able to deliver them. Um, for HTTP, uh, I spoke about uh, the need for chunk transfer encoding when you're creating dynamically sized messages. You may not know at the beginning how big the message is going to be, so you can transfer it in chunks. And uh, we have not provided that support previously. And 60 around bug fixes and other minor enhancements in the product. So this, this version, 8.5, uh, was available um, the Thursday of ESUG. So where are we going? Um, well, we have future releases. We do releases uh, about, about twice a year. Uh, our next one is planned for the end of, of Q1 2012. Uh, we maintain a product roadmap on our website uh, with uh, the most current information about what will be in the next release. It does change. So what I show you here is what it was when I left Raleigh. It hasn't changed yet as far as I know. Um, how, do we, how do we decide what we're going to do in, in a release? Well, um, we have direct interaction with our customers. I go out and visit customers. Our, our VP of sales visits customers. Um, we have online forums, the Google group, where people provide requirements. Um, people send in support cases that turn out to be enhancements, not bug fixes. And um, we have internal requirements, oftentimes uh, satisfying a customer requirement will require some internal infrastructure work um, that really doesn't show through necessarily to the customer, but is a, is a prerequisite for doing the customer changes. So those are sort of where the, uh, the requirements come from. Oh, and my boss, the president of the company, he has his ideas about what we should do, and uh, those also get folded in, obviously. So where are we going with the next release? We're working on, uh, on uh, the GUI look and feel. Uh, we'll finish the rebar control. We'll um, upgrade the progress bar, which was one of the early uh, Windows common controls that has been enhanced over time. And uh, uh, we don't have support for those enhancements at the moment. And we're adding support for the date and time picker, which is a calendar-like. Uh, control. We're also uh, going to add support for PNG files uh, because these are a, a, a more efficient uh, representation of, um, of graphics than an icon file. And so we're going to probably convert our icons to use PNGs instead. For the web interface, as I said, uh, we're going to have an early release of Seaside, probably 3.0.6.3. Um, and we're working on multi-part uh, form support because we need that for uploads in Seaside. Right now we don't support uploads. Uh, for, tele for development tools, improvements to code assist, uh, we're working on things like, as I said, smart characters, um, camel casing suggestions, um, which is, you know, like if you want ordered collection, you could type capital O, capital C, and we would expand it to a suggestion of uh, ordered collection. Um, wild cards in the, uh, in the method, so you could type like um, asterisk, um, some text characters, and we would, we would search on, on that and provide you all suggestions that have those characters at the end. For middleware, um, we, we have shipped Glorp support. Um, it's, it's a bit back level. Uh, we're, bring, we're going to bring it up, probably not quite to the current level, but to a much more current level than we have now. Uh, we're trying to take incremental steps. Um, and um, 
MQ is IBM's message queuing technology, uh, and because many of our customers are mainframe customers, they use MQ to transfer information from, from their local servers to their mainframe servers, for example. Um, and uh, we need to keep that current. Uh, okay, and finally, um, here on this slide, our Windows service support um, in terms of uh, instantiating a, a Windows service uh, that's a Smalltalk application uh, was originally done in C. It was done in the, the startup executable. There's no reason it needs to be there. It can all be done in Smalltalk, and we're going to move it to Smalltalk because that gives you the, uh, the opportunity to customize what's done instead of having to follow our pattern of how a service should be started up. Um, for um, SST is server small talk. It's our, it's our sort of server platform for communication and um, for distributing objects. Uh, lightweight marshalling is the mechanism that's used to marshal objects to move them across the network to another server small talk. And uh, we're making uh, fairly significant improvements in performance there. And for installation, we plan on moving from our current custom installer that uh, um, gives, us, gives us some problems, uh, to say the least, to standard installers using Install Shield on, uh, on Windows and uh, RPM, DEB, uh, package, BFF files, um, depending on what platform you're installing on, uh, on Unix. Uh, and that will satisfy another one of our customer requirements, which is, which is uh, uh, headless in installation on Unix for installing on server systems. So that's, that's the next release. That's what's going to be available sometime near the end of the first quarter. Um, somehow we always seem to align on conference boundaries, you know, so um, the uh, Small Talk Industry Conference is in March, which is kind of near the end of the first quarter, so that's kind of our target. So, you know, we have a number of, of sort of priority areas where we, uh, where we focus our work. Um, internationalization has been a, a, a real sore point. And, and part of it is because it involves some fairly significant changes to our VM. So um, we have a, actually a, kind of a subgroup of developers who are working on the VM now, um, instead of just me. And that's a good thing, because uh, we actually have involved some fairly knowledgeable VM people. And uh, we'll get that done. Uh, in terms of the web interface, um, we'll continue to upgrade our Seaside support. We have a number of other um, customer issues uh, that are really enhancements to the product that we need to address. Uh, for the look and feel, we need to bring that HPI project forward. We need to finish the uh, window common controls. We have a number of, of our add-ons that have extended the widget framework, and we want to backport some of that to the base because there's some very some very useful function there. Development tools, our, our change browser is uh, not so good. Uh, it, it definitely needs improvement and we have, a, we have a project involved in doing that. Um, Code Assist is an ever ongoing uh, effort now that we have provided it. And we're also working on a Monticello importer. Not an exporter, just an importer. Uh, in order to ease the, um, the porting of Seaside, uh, as well as any other code uh, coming in from Faro or Squeak, but primarily for Seaside, because I'm tired of doing file outs. <laughs> um, we're going to put dialogues on our setting framework. Um, we're going to, um, so some of this, if you don't work with mainframe, you may not know about database. DB2 from IBM database product, which is, which is really oriented to the mainframe. 
We're going to continue to focus on GORP. We're going to get it up to current levels. Uh, we're looking at active records. Um, we're investigating TCP IP v6, not getting any strong customer needs there. Um, security frameworks have been an ongoing issue. We have OpenSSL support built into our HTTP layer, but it's not exposed at the common layer where you could use it for um, encrypting files or anything that wasn't involved with HTTP. Um, we're definitely looking at the, uh, at the VM in terms of 64-bit support incremental garbage collection because as images get very large you don't want to stop the world um, class library performance hotspots um, and we have we have a number of internal tools having to do with uh, looking at memory that we want to uh, bring into the product um, we're looking at various external interfaces particularly to dot net um, we're looking at uh, ways to improve our collection um, hierarchy both in terms of hashing and sorting by providing uh, policy driven hashing and sorting so you've heard about a lot of things maybe you'd like to try out VA small talk uh, so the question is how do you get a copy um, we have evaluation copies um, that um, you can get they cost nothing um, there's the uh, there's the URL. Um, you can buy development licenses. We like that um, because that's, that keeps me coming to the conference. It pays our expenses. Um, we have in the past um, done development builds uh, that we've made public. These are interim, interim releases that have not been through our full testing cycle, but they perhaps provide some functionality that people want early. We've also posted some uh, features into the vast goodies repository uh, which is where our open source projects live um, just until the next release comes out um, you can be a committer on an open source project obviously a small talk open source project um, if you're a committer um, here's the URL you want to go to where you can get a fully paid up license um, or you can work for an educational institution if you're a professor at a, at a university. Uh, we give uh, academic licenses. So there's a number of ways to get the product. Here's our email addresses. Please feel free to contact us um, either through the general email addresses or me personally. Um, I'm happy to hear from people. And that's it. Do I have do I have questions? Oh yes. Yes. You have you have about one minute before lunch. <laughs> I just want to know you said that you were going to score continuations on this right? Yes. Uh, that means that you have to change the game because there was a problem. Yes. So if you're planning that for the next release? Um, it depends on how our VM work progresses. Uh, okay. We are actually uh, we're actually looking at doing uh, um, perhaps a fairly major change to the VM. Um, so it's not it's not for sure when that's going to happen. Uh, and you know if it's far enough out, then I'm going to have to retrofit the current uh, the current the existing VM uh, with that support. Other questions? Thank you very much.